Hello! Welcome to Orgo Made Easy Problem of the Day, uh, number one. Welcome to the series. Um, the purpose of this series, if you haven't seen my last video introducing it, is to show you guys some of the really good problems that I encountered during tutoring and also to give you guys a little glimpse into my mind and see how I would tackle Orgo problems, like this one. Um, the solutions for Orgo Made Easy Problems of the Day will be posted on our Instagram, uh, instagram.com slash Orgo Made Easy. Sophia is one of the Orgo Made Easy peer tutors who work with me and she's actually a former student of mine and she's going to be posting the solutions to these problems of the day uh, in written form on our Instagram and then I'll be making the video solutions uh, in video form on YouTube. Okay, so uh, this is problem of the day number one and the problem is... Please show a detailed mechanism for the following reaction. NMR was used to determine the product of this reaction. The guy who had to do it was grumpy afterwards. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a mechanism problem that you would probably encounter towards the end of Orgo 1, or maybe the beginning of Orgo 2, um, or maybe even in the middle of Orgo 1, depending on how your class is set up. But yeah, I think this is a really good problem to show you guys how we would tackle mechanism problems like this one. And the topics that you would need to know before you could tackle this would be like carbocation rearrangements, um, maybe SN1, SN2, but you might have already learned those without your professor even telling you that's called SN1 or SN2. So anyways, here we go. Um, whenever you tackle any mechanism problems, uh, I always recommend my students to follow these two steps here. Uh, step one, a lot of students, they forget to do it, even after I teach them to do it, but you want to number all your carbons, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So I always start with our starting material, and I start numbering our carbons. Um, I'm just going to arbitrarily start here. So this methyl group, I'll label it carbon number one. This will be two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we have a branching point here, and it doesn't really matter because you can label, label this twelve. I mean, not twelve. Eleven, twelve and 13. Now, it really doesn't matter how you number your carbons, but for the purposes of this, of this video, it's probably best if you number it how I number it, um, just so it will make sense when I explain it. But as long as you number all your carbons and you're consistent, you should be fine. So, oh, I forgot to say this, but um, why don't you try out this problem first and see if you can get the solution. And if you get stuck, then hit play uh, and watch me explain it to you. Okay, so now that you number all your carbons, what you want to do is find where all these carbons are in your product after the mechanism has occurred. So you typically look for something that is kind of like a, I guess you call it like a landmark sort of, something that wouldn't really change during the reaction. So what stands out to me immediately is this two carbon chain here coming off the ring. So this must be carbon number seven, still. Okay, and then if that's number if that's carbon number seven, then this still must be carbon number six. And if that's six, then six must still be attached to five because nothing, probably nothing, probably nothing happened there. Five must still be attached to eight and four because our ring didn't really change. It's it's still a six-membered ring and the groups are attached here. So this is probably eight. F four. Four is probably still attached to three. Uh, eight's still probably attached to nine. And nine is probably still attached to 10, which is also attached to three, which is just consistent to everything from before. Okay, now is the trickier part because that portion is where things changed. Let's see. Well, 10 is, attached, uh, 10 is attached to a alkene double bond here, and it is also attached there. So this is probably 12, and 12 is probably still attached to 13. But now there's an OH there attached to 10, which is kind of weird. And 
11 is gone. 11 is no longer on carbon 10. All right. Hmm. Well, carbon 3 is attached to 2 before. And it looks like 2 was attached to a methyl group before. And there is something that matches that description here. So this is probably carbon 2 and carbon 1. And all that leaves is carbon number 11, which is here. And it looks like it migrated up here. So carbon 11. Yeah. OK. Does that make sense? If not, just ask uh, your, whatever your question is down below in the comments, and I'll get to it as soon as I can. All right. Um, let's see. What else do I notice? I notice that we have a water, and then we don't have a water anymore. So that's in our product. We have HCl. So, oh, I jumped a step. So after you number all your carbons, you find where they are after the reaction has occurred. You want to analyze what happened. Analyze what bonds were made and what bonds were broken. So you can have a better idea of what you need to do during the actual mechanism. So a big part of doing mechanisms is actually the setup. Once you set it up properly, the mechanism part happens really quickly. So I want you to take a few seconds, pause the video, and analyze what happened. What bonds were made, what bonds were broken, what changed. Okay? Hit pause and come back in a few seconds. All right, so what I was saying before was the water. Um, because we don't have water in our product, we have HCl, that means that the oxygen must have entered our molecule, which makes sense because, um, look, we have an OH in our molecule. So that OH probably came from the water, and then the other H in the water probably became the H of the, of the, of the HCl that the Cl is attached to in the product. Okay? So I'm going to make a list, for, a little list for myself. Uh, I always do, okay, I'm going to flip this because it says made and broken, but I'm going to do BB for bonds broken and B, uh, B, I guess BF for bonds formed. So bonds broken and bonds formed. So bonds broken, we have, hmm, we have a Cl to carbon 2 bond that broke over here. And then we made a Cl to hydrogen bond. So that's there. What else? What other bond broke? All right, I see that carbon 11 to carbon 10, that bond right here, broke. And then carbon 11 formed a bond with carbon 3. Okay, and then that's really all you can really see from here, I think. But I actually see one more thing. Um, this might be tough to see, but if 11 migrated to 3, that means 3 must have lost a bond. Otherwise, it can't handle accepting a new bond with 11. The carbon 3 would overload its octet, and it wouldn't make any sense. So I actually see something that some of you might have missed, but a carbon 3 bond with hydrogen actually broke. There's a hydrogen right here. And I know that because carbon is normally attached to four bonds, and it only is only three bonds are shown here, so the missing hydrogen must be the fourth bond. So the carbon 3 to hydrogen bond here must have been broken, and then that hydrogen must have migrated to which carbon? Can you find it? All right, pause the video if you need to, but it went to carbon number two. Uh, so uh, hydrogen to carbon number two bond was formed. Because carbon number two only had one hydrogen before. And now there's actually two hydrogens here. And I know that because carbon two only has um, two bonds shown. So I'm going to actually erase that. But you can, you can do this mechanism without really um, realizing this, but it just helps. OK, so let's do it. Um, what's probably going to be the first step? Um, what do you think? I think that Cl will leave. And I think that because 
nothing else can really happen. We have water here. Water is not really reactive and won't do anything on its own. Um, we do have a double bond here, but the double bond is not going to react with water. We've never seen it really react with water in, our, in organic chemistry without there being like some acid or something to, um, let's see, disturb the molecules. So I think Cl is just going to leave like in an SN2 or an E1, oh, sorry, not SN2, SN1 or E1. And when it leaves, it's going to create a carbocation on carbon number two. Uh, and it creates a carbocation two because uh, two is losing electrons. It's losing the two electrons. Well, there are two electrons in this bond. One is carbon twos and one is chlorines. But chlorine is taking both electrons as it leaves. So carbon two is going to get a plus charge on it. All right, go ahead and draw what you get as a result from there. And then we'll regroup it. Okay, so this is what I got. Um, I also got a carbocation up here. And then, like I said, keep number your carbons, don't lose them. Otherwise, you can lose a part of your molecule and get your mechanism wrong. So make sure you label everything. Let's see, six, six is attached to seven. Okay, five is still attached to eight. Eight's attached to nine. Nine's attached to ten, etc., etc. All right, so now that two's left and there's a carbocation on there, we can manipulate that carbon. Um, also, this carbon here is on a secondary carbon, which is that carbocation is on a secondary carbon. So that's bad. And the moment you see that, you should freak out. Red alert, that's bad. Something can happen. Um, a carbocation rearrangement can happen. So a hydride shift, a methyl shift, a ring arra rearrangement. Um, if you don't know what that is, make sure you check out the videos in my Organic Chemistry 1 playlist that talk about that. But carbocations, when they're on a secondary carbon, they can shift to somewhere else in the molecule. So where can it go? We, like I said before, we made, oh, also I just broke the carbon, I mean the chlorine to carbon two bond, so that's done during that step. And uh, let's see, we also have a Cl minus floating around. So what happens next is carbon three has a hydrogen that can migrate to carbon two. So we can do a hydride shift. And what that means is the hydrogen on carbon three is going to go on to, or the electrons in the bond is going to go on to carbon two, so that the carbocation is now on carbon three. Now that happens because three is losing electrons when the hydrogen and its bond shifts over. So three is going to become positive. And two is gaining electrons, so then two is no longer has a positive charge on it. Okay, so go ahead and draw the product. And we just broke our carbon three to hydrogen bond. And we just formed our hydrogen to carbon two bond. All right, so you should get this now. Um, once again, bring in your numbers. One, so from here. Okay, so now your carbocation is where? It's on carbon three. Okay, carbon three, because it lost electrons as those two electrons migrated over to two. All right, now there's another hydrogen on two, but we don't need to show it. Technically, you don't even need to show this hydrogen after the hydride shift, but it's helpful for keeping track. Um, so now, and we know that the methyl group has to migrate, or the methyl group here, carbon 11, has to migrate up to carbon 3 to get to our product. The molecule looks more like our final product, or a little bit, I guess. And so we're going to do that because we have a plus charge right next to it. And this is a tertiary carbon, which is pretty stable, but since in our product the methyl group moves up there, we have to shift it. So the methyl is going to go here. You draw the arrow from the bond to the carbon. All right, And just remember that actually what's happening is that both electrons in that bond are migrating and giving that carbon three electrons. All right, so what do you get after that? Okay, 
that should be what you get. And we just migrated carbon 11 to carbon 3, so we made the carbon 11 to 3 bond, and we broke the carbon 11 to 10 bond. Now we're there. Carbon 11 migrated up to 3, so that part's done. We're basically, we're basically done with the reaction. Um, what's missing here, though? The plus charge. It went from 3 to 10. And that's because 10 lost electrons when, those, when the methyl group left with its bond. Okay? And now that the plus charge is on 10, that allows the water molecule to attack in, like in a SN1 reaction. So your water molecule goes in and attacks the carbon, technically, if I can't reach it. And you get to here. Let's see, am I still in the frame? Yes, I am in the frame. All right, so, oh, I'm out of the camera. Yeah, I'm out of the camera. All right, so now you have water here, yep. I'm gonna drop the bonds because we're gonna need to react with the bonds now. Why? Well, because the water lost electrons during the attack. It used up its lone pair. And now those lone pairs are now a bond. And one of those electrons is carbon number 10s. Carbon number 10. I stopped numbering carbons here because we're at our last step, but you guys should keep numbering carbons the entire time. Um, yeah, also our water lost electrons, so it gets a positive charge. But how do we fix it? Well, look at our product. We, the, not we, the water is missing hydrogen. So that Cl from before here travels along. It's been here with us the entire time and it helps us out at this last step because it's going to grab one of the hydrogens and then by grabbing the hydrogen you're freeing up or releasing the electrons in this bond here this OH bond so that they can go on to the oxygen as a lone pair well technically this oxygen has two lone pairs so there's another one here but you don't have to show all the lone pairs so to recap, that chlorine from way back in the beginning now made its bond with hydrogen. And it came in, grabbed the hydrogen, freeing up the electrons in the bond between the O and the H, allowing those electrons to go onto the O, providing electrons, neutralizing the positive charge, and creating your HCl and product at the same time. And that's it. Voila. You've just done uh, Orgomedes problem of the day number one. Yeah, so I hope that was helpful, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask us um, down below to make sure you also do a recap of this. So kind of, um, I guess, explain it back to me uh, from your notes, just to make sure you understand why each step happens, and just to make sure you fully understand it, okay? And just to also to recap, in the future we could do mechanisms, always number your carbons first, in the, in the starting material. Figure out where they are in your product so you can better analyze which bonds remain and broken, which bonds moved, and then once you figure out what moved and etc, etc, the mechanism is so much more easier because you can kind of refer back to your little, I guess, table of bonds broken and bonds formed. I know this is kind of not, I guess, a natural way to think about mechanisms, but trust me, I've been doing this for several, several years and I found that this is the um, easiest way to do mechanisms. It just takes a little time to get used to, but yeah, try it out yourself. Let me know if it works for you, and uh, make sure be sure to follow us on Instagram at orgomadeeasy. Uh, not orgomadeeasy. Instagram slash Instagram slash orgomadeeasy um, for more problems of the day. We'll have problems coming up every week, and be sure to tune back in for more solutions. And if you're interested in private tutoring with me or one of my tutors, be sure to check out our website, orgomadeeasy.org. We also have a bunch of awesome resources that don't cost that much, especially if you can't afford private tutoring. These alternative um, resources are the way to go. So thanks for watching, and I hope I was able to make Orgo easy for you. All right, bye. Yep, see ya.